only hours ago, I was exploring a cave on Easter Island. Or, or was it days or, or weeks? The truth is, I have no idea. For I have lost all concept of time. Okay, so we appear to have gone to the same place first. He went first. The moment I touched the swirling imagery, I was suddenly enveloped in a brilliant white light. I felt myself spiraling downward, as if tumbling into a bottomless void. I clamped my eyes shut against the spinning vortex as paralyzing fear seized my mind. Would I survive this journey? Finally, the whirling sensation had stopped. Obviously, I was no longer in the cool confines of the cave. For a long time, I stood motionless, gathering my composure. Then I opened my eyes. It's hot and dry here. I'm in a civilized area, on a cliff overlooking a river. The structures around me look Egyptian. There's a small pyramid not far from here and what appears to be a barge docked by the river. Is it conceivable that I've traveled through time to ancient Egypt? I need to shake my disbelief and explore this place. I'm dying to talk to someone, hear their speech, but I'm dreading it too. My clothes and language are not exactly local. What do I say? Who do I say I am? Will they even understand me? After that journey through the device on Easter Island, nothing should amaze me now. But fate is not through with me yet. Moments ago, I approached a small chapel-like structure near my arrival point. I was examining the odd symbology at the bottom of its shallow pool. A boat, symbols of baskets, and other forms in odd arrangements. As I touched the water to refresh myself, a sheep formed out of the pool's own water, rose up, and spoke to me. I fell backwards and my head missed a column by inches. The watcher being spoke of the river, I'm wondering if the marking in the pool is part of the message. I'll know when I get to the river. I just touched the stones of the pyramid, so I know I'm not dreaming. Its white limestone casing gleam brighter than I could have ever imagined. If this were my own time, this place would be in ruins, crumbled by the hand of man and buried by time. Yet it's all perfect. The pyramid looks as if it were built yesterday. This is incredible. I've actually traveled back through time to the era when Egypt was at its peak, when the Nile nourished the greatest civilization on Earth. Apparently, I lost my knapsack in transport. All I have left is what was in my pockets. At least I've got my journal and camera. The Easter Island viewer into other worlds has turned out to be a mode of transportation through both time and space, a time portal, or as I personally call it, either the time gate or the space-time lava lamp. But who could have built it? It's far beyond mankind's current technologies. What should I do? There is no time gate here where I've landed. Hey, I was complaining about that earlier. As much as I want to stay and explore, I also want to get back to my own time, at least eventually. This is a far cry from the first Egyptian pyramid I visited over 20 years ago. It was one of my first digs as an archaeology student. I remember staring at the crumbling step stone of King Zoser. Its architect, Imhotep, was worshipped as a god for his achievements. He pioneered building with stone and perfected new construction methods. I noted that the pyramid builders seemed obsessed with precision. I had thoroughly researched the controversial theories of the Scottish astronomer Charles Piazza Smith, who in 1864 astounded Egyptologists with his claim that the perfect proportions of the Great Pyramid of Khufu could only have been achieved through the guidance of the gods. He had pointed out that despite the immensity of the Great Pyramid of Giza, its sides were of almost identical length, an incredible engineering feat for primitive people, and the pyramid is aligned on a superbly accurate north-south orientation. Smith's theory fascinated me, especially when I observed firsthand that the ventilation shafts in the Great Pyramid were exactly aligned with the North Star in Orion, a condition that required both precise alignment and an accurate measurement of time. These shafts were formed from millions of tons of precisely positioned stone. A final oddity, the height of the Giza Pyramid is 451 feet, the same as the average height of land on Earth. The depth of its foundation is 212 feet, the average depth of each of Earth's seven oceans. Some aside information here. 
Had Alex waited just a tiny bit, okay, a lot longer, to enter the time gate, he would have heard about a form of mapping interior structures for passages and other open spaces using muons. These subatomic particles, without getting into too much, especially since I am not well-versed myself, are used similar to how one would use an x-ray to see the skeleton of a human body. But muons are heavier, last longer, and are cool enough to be cosmic rays. So where am I going with this? Well, this technique was used on the Great Pyramid. There's a massive void underneath it. Void is just a term for empty or somewhat empty space. Of course, what that void is actually for is a bit of an unknown right now. But um, some ramp theories for pyramid construction position the ramps on the interior of the structures. So maybe this void has something to do with that. I don't really know. Actually, no one really knows. You can't really go in there and start smacking around a drill, or are you going to potentially destabilize the region? And nobody really wants mucking about with the very foundation of the pyramid in order to explore some great void discovery to end up destroying the foundation of the very pyramid and breaking it. That would be a very terrible day if that happened. Could these radical innovations in building methods be attributed to the genius of one man, or possibly several? Or did some outside factor help propel these architectural breakthroughs? Many of my contemporary colleagues don't believe that this ancient civilization could have achieved such perfection so quickly, not without some history of prior development. Did the ancient Egyptians really build the pyramids themselves, or did they receive the advice or help of advantaged beings? Did the Maya or Easter Islanders? I clearly remember the moment when I was seized by the striking resemblance of Imhotep's creation in the Maya pyramids built centuries later. To me, that similarity was one of the more obvious links between the Egyptian and Mayan civilizations. In addition, the Egyptians and the Maya had accurate calendars. Both their calendars began their new year on the same day, which equates to our February 26th. I was looking for other similarities and ended up looking for mummies of Mayan culture, which ended up looking for mummies that were all preserved, which led to me having an existential crisis that one day I am going to die and each day could be my last. That I'll look back on all my work as a young person and look at the videos many years in the future of a window into my own past that I can never recreate and I'll never get back while I'm on there on my dying deathbed. Sorry, anyway, when my research starts going in the direction of death, I always end up freaking out. Back to the journal. The pyramid door is sealed with an impassable combination lock in its center. How did it get here? The Egyptians had no knowledge of combination locking. I've never heard of it or come across it in all of my studies. I've explored the surrounding area for several hours. Beyond this complex, there's nothing but desert. Everything is as it was 4,000 years before I was born. But there's not a living soul around, at least not on this side of the river. Perhaps the bank is reserved for ceremonial purposes. There is a large structure across the river. I can just barely make it out in the haze. It appears to be some sort of temple. Well, that's where we're trying to get to, too. I've considered swimming across it, but it would be suicidal. I've seen enormous crocodiles swimming in the water. I hear creaking wood down by the river. The barge in this slip is exactly what I need. I've tried to open the barge's gates by force, but without success. Apparently, this gate is not locked with a simple mechanism. Now that I've followed the connections to the gate, I can see how the system works, but I'm still confused. I keep thinking of the glyphs at the bottom of that shallow pool on the hillside. Perhaps I should take another look. Of course, irrigation played a key role in reaping the rewards of the Egyptian soil. It's one of the hallmarks of advanced civilizations. I don't know why the elaborate barge release mechanism was used. Perhaps to thwart thieves. I crossed the river and docked at a magnificent temple situated at the edge of the water. A crocodile blocked my path until I decided to fight back. Well, I'm glad he dealt with that crocky, so I don't need to. I've walked from one end of this area to the other, all the way from the temple dock to a room walled with statues and crystals. This side of the river also seems devoid of life, except for the occasional lizard. For the moment, I've resigned myself to be an archaeologist instead of an ambassador. I'm off to investigate a buzzing sound. What I heard was not insects, but some kind of continuous pulsing spark almost like electricity. I discovered it behind a panel. 
I'm not sure what it does, unless the three nearby symbols are an indication. One of them is a pyramid. I'm not sure about the other two. I was right. This is a power source. Electricity was known to some older cultures long before modern man discovered it. And this appears to be more than some crude copper iron battery. Drawings have been found that hint at the Egyptians' use of a large lightning globes with wires apparently connected to them. Such lighting may have been used by artisans working deep inside the pyramids. It could explain why no suit marks were found on the ceilings of these sealed areas where men must have worked for weeks, months, and years. I suspect this conduit controls a great deal of power. I've never seen stone do such a thing, acting like a liquid and morphing into distinct shapes. I thought the ball was a lens, a viewer for the symbols around the base. As I moved the ball, the statue changed shape, forming the heads of various Egyptian deities. What known material can do this? What kind of forces are at work? I've made the trek back and forth on the walkway between the two buildings in this complex. Its obelisks watch each of my steps like secret sentinels, each the agent of an Egyptian god. It's ironic that a culture that went to such great lengths to document itself was sentenced to silence. First, when Julius Caesar burned the Library of Alexandria, which was filled with Egyptian knowledge and history. Then, when hand copies of many works were burned 400 years later in a temple fire. And finally, when religious zealots in 550 AD killed off the few remaining practitioners of the ancient Egyptian religion. These were the last people on earth who could read hieroglyphics. In time, even the Egyptians' text written in Greek expressly for their foreign occupiers was lost. In 1799, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, a royal decree that was identically conveyed in three different languages, revolutionized the study of ancient hieroglyphics. For all my Rosetta Stone comments about the Rongorongo board in Easter Island, I was using Rosetta Stone as an adjective there. Here, this is the Rosetta Stone, the the, the noun. Two of the languages, Greek and Aramaic, were known. The third was ancient Egyptian. What a find! And what cosmic connection brought the linguistic genius of Jean-Francois Champollion together with this priceless work? It was the sounding out of historically familiar names written on the stone in the three languages that first associated spoken sounds to hieroglyphics. And what a stroke of luck that the Egyptians customarily gave importance to names by encircling them in their texts. My name Alexander in hieroglyphics. So essentially the names of Egyptian pharaohs and other people of importance in Egypt were basically encircled in what's called a cartouche. Champollion's breakthrough was concluding that the language is both ideographic, where one symbol means a whole word or concept, and phonetic, where a symbol is simply a sound. I've longed to make such groundbreaking discoveries. Fate and history will determine if my discovery of the time gate will prove to be an even greater achievement. It's been a dry, warm evening, enchanting actually. I really miss Laura. I wish she was here to share my dinner of fresh dates. Wait, you called me and not her? Anyway, I've just discovered the mummified remains of someone in a side room. I'm risking disturbing his eternal slumber, but I have no choice. I've got to take a DNA sample back with me. Before I boarded the plane to Easter Island, news had reached me of a fabulous discovery in the Valley of the Kings, a burial ground of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. Beneath the rubble-strewn earth of the valley, only 100 feet from the tomb of Ramses II, archaeologists uncovered the door to a crypt sealed through countless centuries. Beyond the door was the largest and most complex tomb ever found in Egypt a huge array of corridors, levels, and rooms. And within these rooms lay scores of sarcophagi, stone coffins holding the mummified remains of the 52 royal sons of Ramses. Bloody hell, that's a lot of sons. I almost decided to turn back and head for Egypt. I couldn't risk losing my current funding, so I did the next best thing. I asked Laura to follow up on the find and start the required paperwork for the Egyptian authorities that I would need. The tombs of several pharaohs have been excavated throughout the ages. Indeed, the well-preserved mummy of Ramses himself reigned as the centerpiece of Cario's Egyptian Museum. Yet, 
This was the first time that the direct descendants of a pharaoh had ever been found. I knew at once that here was another opportunity to further prove my theory. This would support the work Laura had begun and validate my credibility. Some years before, I had received permission to examine the mummy of Ramses and had extracted a minute quantity of DNA from the Maro in his skin bone. I've also collected abundant genetic material from the pyramid workers of that era, their corpses preserved by the dry desert heat. I had planned to do C14 dating tests on the material. Thank goodness I didn't! This was the genetic material used by Laura to link several cultures with the genetic marker. If a genetic marker is found when the sons are tested, and I believe it will, it will appear in the DNA of both Ramses and his sons, yet will not be present in the genetic material of ordinary Egyptians of that era. I strongly suspect only leaders will show that marker. The sample I'm bringing back with me will also validate my claim. If I'm right, the gene marker will be identical to the one we've identified in the priests, shaman, and kings of the Maya, Easter Islanders, and Anasazi. The last link will be to prove they evolved from a single source, Atlantis. Today, I found works more precious to me than gold and jewels. Hand-painted papyrus scrolls. They are so fresh that I can handle them without the threat of their disintegrating into dust. I found them in a chest. I wish I had brought more film for my instant camera. The spare rolls were in the knapsack, and I've only got 36 shots left. Since I don't know where I'm going, I'll need to use it sparingly. It's a good thing I like to draw. I've been examining the scrolls I found. They confirm that the mummification process of these times matches my 20th century findings. The task took up to 70 days starting with the removal of the brain through the nose by using a hook. The lungs and internal organs were removed and preserved in canopic jars. The heart was left inside the body to be judged by Osiris in the next world. The body was embalmed using a salt called natron, then wrapped in bandages with amulets between the layers and finally placed in a sarcophagus. A priest wearing the mask of Anubis, the god of mummification, touched the mummy's mouth, giving it the power to eat, drink, and move. This process was developed over many years and reserved for nobility. I've always been thankful for its use since it made ancient Egypt so much more real and fascinating to modern man. In a way, it did ensure a measure of immortality. I found one of the scrolls fascinating. Its title was The Voyage of the Learned One. The Learned One was a woman whose name is not mentioned. The writer, Manahep, a healer of the time, writes this personal account. In the land of the pyramids, a learned one fell ill. A fire from within possessed her body, and she closed her eyes to see and speak no more. I was among the trusted few of my profession to witness the ritual of her preservation. In great and caring haste, the other learned ones took her body to a glowing temple. They anointed her with mysterious fluids and placed in a sacred chamber where they said the departed one could rest and cross great waters to the world of the ancients, there to be restored again. She was beautiful, and the learned ones said that her beauty would remain upon her into the afterlife. I asked how this was possible, but they assured me that such works would be far above the grasp of men for centuries to come. What happened? Did she just, like, ascend to a higher plane of existence or something? I recounted this story to the pharaoh's priests. I feared they would not believe me, but they had witnessed other great works by the learned ones. They did believe, swore me to secrecy, and vowed themselves to solve the mystery of immortality and bestow it upon our great pharaoh. This is a far cry from the process eventually used by the Egyptians and certainly by the mummy I have found here. According to this scroll, there was no removal of the organs, no incantations, no religious actions at all. Why would these learned ones rush to mummify a corpse? This was no 70-day ritual. Their actions seem more like a medical process, an emergency procedure, in fact. Oh, good point. Could the stricken learned one have been in a coma? In the 20th century, some people with fatal diseases had themselves frozen in the hope of being revived someday when a cure was developed. This incredible scroll could easily be describing such an event. 
These learned ones seem to have had no doubts about the eventual resurrection as a result of this procedure. My goddess, the afterlife crossing over to another world, both these concepts could have been sparked or fueled by this account and perhaps countless others. Was this woman transported somewhere as I have been? This scroll may be describing the very seed of Egyptian mummification. It seems perfectly possible that the Egyptians experimented with mummification to achieve immortality without basis for comprehending the technology of life preservation, much less implementing it. They made it a mystical ritual that produced the mummies we found. I'm taking most of these scrolls with me. There's a lifetime of research to be done on these alone. I've spent some time gathering my thoughts, and I believe these scrolls support my theories. It seems to me that the scrolls reference to the world of the ancients is alluding to some other location where more elaborate medical facilities might have been available. Perhaps a distant homeland or the source of knowledge and enlightenment. What if this homeland was the lost city of Atlantis? And the gods were merely technically advanced visitors from Atlantis. Could they have been the learned ones? It's such a simple, elegant solution which would explain many of the enigmas surrounding ancient civilizations. I've searched for a link between ancient civilizations and Atlantis for so many years. I can hardly believe I may actually prove it. Most important of all, if this scroll is factual, then there's a time gate in this world. I suspect we archaeologists have been reading interpretations of such time travel events all along and attributing them to pure myth. I have a strong feeling that the Egyptians really were visited by the builders of the time gates and helped in ways I cannot quite comprehend. I was exploring deeper into the building, the Crystal Hall, but a rather persistent cobra was apparently standing guard. It must have claimed that territory. The damn thing nearly blinded me. Thankfully, my vision has come back fully, but it still won't allow me to proceed through the passage past the Crystal Hall. There must be some spell or charm to deal with this creature. My personal favorite anti-snake spell? A fully loaded P90. Today, I discovered yet another scroll hidden inside the standing statue in a temple storeroom. I accidentally bumped it with my knee and heard the familiar hollow sound of a secret compartment. On the scroll is a cryptic list of eight items. The number eight seems to be a key in this place. There are eight obelisks, eight crystals in the hall on the other end of the obelisk walkway, and eight crystals in the well in that same room. The scroll has unique symbols before or after the sign of various gods. I'm reminded of the Egyptian religious saying that Professor Darren used to have on his desk. Proceed the gods and things will be subtracted from you. Follow the gods and things will be surely added onto you. I'm going back to the crystal hall to try my hunch. I've made no entries for hours. I've been far too engrossed in some test of wits that's had me on edge since I got past that cobra. One thing's for sure, that humming power center in the temple directs power to some important places near and far. I have just encountered a spirit of some kind. He wore the royal headdress of a pharaoh. He spoke to me of the history of his people. I don't know how, but I understood his words as if he used some form of telepathy to plant them in my brain. According to this spirit, the universal god Osiris sent learned ones from a distant place. They offered the gift of enlightenment to the pharaoh and promised that his offspring would be great in mind and spirit. Who were these learned ones and where did they come from? Were these the same as the great ones of Easter Island? I assume the gift of enlightenment was utilized in Egypt as evidenced by the incredible achievements of the culture. But what gift could be offered to Easter Islanders and Egyptians alike that would remotely have the same effect? Was it written documents, a number system, some kind of calculating device, a calendar, tools, machinery? If the gift was something tangible, it may be still here. I wonder what the Egyptians' fate would have been without the apparent boost they received. The early Egyptians were primitive people tied to the annual cycles of flood and drought. Then, within the space of a single generation, 
A sudden rise of civilization burst over Egypt. It is interesting to acknowledge that the Egyptian culture appears to have begun at an elevated level. The first of the great pharaohs, Menes, united the tribes of Upper and Lower Egypt into a single great nation. Power and wealth abounded, nurturing the rise of the greatest civilization the world had ever known. This was the Pyramid Age. When the magnificent soaring structures rose at Giza, this rapid rise to power seems to support the spirit's claim. Somehow, the Egyptians were intellectually affected. This mysterious absence of living human beings has become my foremost concern. Where is everybody? If an epidemic had swept through, there would be corpses everywhere. With vaccines unknown, a plague could have decimated the entire population, leaving survivors too weakened and few to bury the dead. I've ruled out invasion by an enemy army. If the Hittites army of, or the tribes of Libya had conquered Egypt, they might have carried the Egyptians off to slavery, but they would also have sacked the cities, destroying the temples and tombs along the Nile. They would have left behind part of their invading army to hold their territory. These people apparently left voluntarily as a whole for reasons I can't yet fathom. It's well known that the Egyptians enjoyed games and pleasurable pursuits. I can't resist the temptation to play one I found in an underground room. I'm holding a small artifact, not much bigger than a small jewel box. That's what I thought it was at first, but it doesn't open. It, it's definitely special. And the way it was hidden and protected told me it was valued far above other works. There's a scarab on the cover. Then I saw another vision. I think it was some sort of holographic image. What kind of ancient civilization possessed this level of technical ability? I think we answered that question already, Alex. It was a person speaking of the gift of enlightenment, and she was not Egyptian. I almost expected a warning not to disturb the sacred legacy, but it seemed to me that the vision was a means to record the purpose of the artifact or gift and actually encourage its acceptance. I guess that makes a little bit of sense given what we've seen so far. Those disembodied voices are more of helping us along instead of um, trying to scare us away. Unlike the more primitive Easter Islanders, the Egyptians may have had the ability to comprehend the power of this gift, whatever it was. Right. If we recall, Easter Island had the gift taken away from them, whereas it looks like the Egyptians were allowed to keep the gift. Though it doesn't do much good if there's no Egyptians around anymore. Buto, the Cobra Goddess. Okay, so that um, barge's wadget is definitely Buto. I'm sailing back across the Nile River to attempt to enter the pyramid again. Historians have claimed that the Egyptians built such mighty granite structures for the sole purpose of entombing their kings. But did they? No bodies have ever been discovered inside the pyramids, despite the fact that several burial chambers have been excavated with their seals intact. The sarcophagi inside were undisturbed as well. The mummies may have been moved by priests or tomb raiders. Perhaps the burial chambers were decoys and the real burial vaults lie hidden elsewhere in these man-made mountains. I, I don't fully lean towards any theory, but now I'm in a perfect position to resolve this timeless enigma. I can't believe I missed something so obvious. I have to go back and visit that conduit panel. I think I can maneuver the barge in the dark. It's a calm night and the stars are incredibly bright. Well, whatever he did wrong, I won't make that same mistake. Today, I had a stroke of simplicity, I guess. Archaeologists have always assumed the Egyptians kept their pyramid building methods a secret. Perhaps the Egyptians simply did not know the full process themselves. Suppose advanced visitors sought to impress the Egyptians and Easter Islanders with their technology. Well, that's quite an egotistical alien there. It's possible that the pyramids and statues were a cooperative effort. It's possible that the pyramids and statues were a cooperative effort. Uh, Alex, you, you wrote that already. Anyway, where the people's role was to quarry and carve the stones, and the visitors to levitate the stones into place, perhaps during the night with some futuristic or lost technology akin to lasers. Ooh, lasers do everything. They are only beaten out by tachyon beams. Even to the most advanced Egyptians, this would appear to be magic or the hand of the god. I'm on my way back across the river for another attempt at entering the pyramid. I have had time to think about my travel through time. 
It sounds crazy even to me, but then textbook archaeology could not have predicted the existence of the Time Gate. The reality of the Time Gate potentially explains a great many mysteries to me. I left Easter Island through its Time Gate, emerged here in Egypt on an ordinary spot. I didn't need an arrival Time Gate. Obviously, this time travel technology did not require a device at the destination. Whoever visited here would have been stranded unless they came equipped to construct a local time gate for their eventual return. They would have taken tools with them, some amazing instruments to be sure. With these, they could have easily impressed the locals of the time and defended themselves if necessary. After completing the return gate, they would have established a two-way space time link with their home location. This was alluded to by the old medical scroll. It now seems ludicrous that the Egyptians would have used such extreme precision to build mere tombs. The Great Pyramid abounds with astonishing mathematical relationships relative to itself, the region, the planet, and to celestial objects. However, such precision would have been required by a time travel device. No time traveler would have relished missing their target by a few centuries, or materializing in the center of a volcano. Was the first small pyramid built to house their return gate. The pyramids as a housing for a time gate? I guess that could be what's in the void underneath the Great Pyramid that they've discovered. I mean, it's either that or it's a bunch of grain. And that idea is just silly. Is it possible that the main purpose of the pyramids was to contain time gates as the relationship advanced as opposed to a resting place for the dead? I have no idea of the mathematics involved, but it makes sense that the larger the pyramid, the greater the capacity of the time gate it contained. I don't know, I mean, that time gate in Easter Island did seem like it was actually in the same dimension, but that might just be my imagination. A pyramid's mass, angle, orientation, and proportions may have affected the time gate's function, perhaps through the effect of mass or natural vibrational resonance, like the shape and size of a tuning fork determining the note it plays. But if this is true, then why haven't time gates been found inside the pyramids of modern Egypt? Are they still there waiting to be found? Yeah, why haven't they found a time gate in any of the other pyramids? Well, we now know about the void underneath the Great Pyramid, so... Hey! I'm back at the small pyramid door. I've brought the artifact from the other side, though I'm still not sure of its full purpose. Every fiber of my being feels its importance. If I'm right, the way out of this world is right behind this locked door. Oh, so the door I was trying to get into earlier is the time gate. That's good to know. I just had the fright of my life. Oh, you too, finally. Was it that weird electrical alien creature? Someone or thing doesn't want me here. I, I encountered him or it in the pyramid. I was literally too stunned to panic, so I faced it. It appeared as a swirling electrical charge and threatened me, then it vanished. Could it have been my imagination, or, or is this the personification of some ancient Egyptian curse? Well, if it's your imagination, it's also my imagination. I've done it. I found another time gate.